Here I thought I always explained everything to the point where there was no space for any doubt, but I guess I sucked at it. I heard ya, and now I'll deliver. This is a two-part series where I explain everything in detail for garage kit building. Jesus help me if I still get questions after this. Welcome back, my little resin monkeys! For those of you that are new here, I want to believe that you came upon this video and you're recommended because you're interested in learning more about garage kits. I hope. For those of you new here, you're in for a treat. I am taking this opportunity to explain everything that goes into painting a garage kit. For those of you that are returning subscribers, you know the drill, you know my process, but this time you're gonna get a little bit more techno babble on my part. But don't worry, you can just put my video in the background for noise in case you're doing something else, if not. And if you, you, you still wanna see what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, oh, you're welcome to stay. Over the years, I've been getting questions regarding materials, tools, techniques, and everything else on my videos where I actually explain what they are and where to get them in the description box. But I guess I give people too much credit thinking they are like me and read. Uh, yes, I, I weep for humanity at this point. I asked you guys in the community tab which kit you wanted me to paint to go into detail into the whole process. The majority of you voted for Yoko from Gurren Lagan, which I was honestly surprised it won over a pair of VTuber kits that I had. Which by the way, I'm not into VTubers, I just happen to like that set of figures. So Yoko it is. I tried to answer as many questions as possible regarding the painting process, but there were some things that really didn't apply to this figure, so I'll have to give you a rain check for that. Uh, you can leave your question in the comment section and I will try my best to get back to you regarding it. Also, please, 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 please check the description box below before asking anything. Links to almost everything and anything that I'm using in this video will be posted down there. So please, you know, restore my faith in humanity just a little bit for today. Okay? Okay. But first, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. I've mentioned in the past that while I have a lot of experience in painting figures, I have zero when it comes to sculpting. I honestly want to change that to elevate my creative adventures by starting to learn 3D modeling. A great place I found that provides a wide variety of online classes is Skillshare. Right now, I'm following Zarina's How to Create a Simple Low Poly Character in Blender, where she goes through the basics of modeling a character from scratch if it's your first time doing it. Skillshare provides classes for almost everything for everyone whether it be for actual clay modeling, to time management, and even how to build a portfolio for your creativity. Lauren Holm has a great class to build a brief to boost your passion project. Skillshare offers hundreds of inspiring career-focused classes if you're looking to reinvent your goals and skills. The first 1,000 people to join through the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. And with that out of the way, let's get this show started. All right, the first thing you need to do is super important. You need to open up that box or bag and take a big sniff and breathe in that resiny goodness. Ah, uh, yes, um, a nice vintage from 2008. It still has some of the polyurethane notes from when it was casted. Hmm, subtle rice and soy sauce fragrances too. Hmm, very nice. Once you recover from that religious experience, you can now check all the parts and make sure everything is in there. And unfortunately, we have our first casualty. We'll need to fix this broken bikini bra that's seen better days. Everything is fixable when it comes to resin. All you need are the right tools. Usually the next step I do is dry or test fit all the parts. I do this so that I can see what I'll be working with in regards to gaps between connections. Parts shouldn't wiggle like this ever. It's unstable, and if left like that, you'll have a lot of issues with them staying together and not falling apart. All kits have poor tabs that need to be removed. I always take my trusty nippers to do the job along with my X-Acto knife. I try to cut as flush as possible, but leave the rest to be sanded down because cutting too much will result in damage and needing to re-sculpt the area later. There will always be some piece or two that don't have connection keys, but there's always a workaround to that which you'll see later. 
I did notice the bra straps don't rest where they're supposed to, but we'll fix that in just a bit. Just ho hold on, okay? We're going step by step here. This is why it's important to dry fit, that way you know what you'll have to deal with later. After that, I'm left with a ton of tiny taps to throw away. Try saying that three times fast. Tiny taps, tiny taps, tiny taps. Once everything is in check, I put everything in a container and fill half of it with purple power. Then fill the rest with water and leave it soaking overnight. Before I even start, I always put on some nitrile gloves. For some reason, I have an unpleasant reaction on my skin with this, and this is how I prevent any discomfort. When a kit is casted, the mold is sprayed with a special grease to prevent them from sticking together. Some of that grease transfers onto the kit, and this is crucial if you want your paint to not strip down the line, because we all know any type of lubricant or grease will prevent anything from sticking to the surface, including paint and primer. Before you ask, I did a separate pinning video using this same kit as an example. I did three different methods for pinning, and if you're interested in knowing or learning how to do them, please head on over to that video when you're done here. So you got some homework to do. What? Homework? But I want everything now! Now listen here, you little shit. The world isn't fair sometimes, and you have to work to get the things you want. Be fucking great for you're getting this for free because back in my day, we had to pay money to buy magazines that poorly explain things when we wanted to know what the fuck we were supposed to do. You goddamn whippersnappers. Hey, get off my lawn. Everybody has their own order when it comes to working with kits. Some people like to pin and sand first and then clean, but I like to clean and then start pinning. I've had pins rust as soon as I'd clean out the kit and I just do it in this order now. I will be using a variety of wire sizes that will help me pin medium to tiny pieces. To easily switch between drill bits, I always like to use my chuck adapter. Never leave home without it. I'm taking care of that little bump left from the tab by grinding it down with my rotary tool. Now the leg connects, but there are some gaps that will need some filling later. Some old kits will come with pinholes from when the kit was sculpted, and I usually take advantage of that to know where to drill. Some parts need adjustments for the pin, and for that I always bring out the forbidden yellow mustard to actually help out with this task. Hey, uh, what you doing there? I hope you're gonna ask what I think you're gonna ask, right? You see that? There's a little video card up there on the right. Yeah. I just wanted to verify you saw it, okay? Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to it. And always, always apply Vaseline to the part where you don't want the putty to stick to. That way you can separate the pieces without a problem and remove the Vaseline later. I always take a rag and soak it with a little isopropyl alcohol and make sure to wipe as best as possible. I mentioned in my pinning video that I always pin. It's rare when I don't, but it's usually very tiny pieces that are not in danger of falling off if I touch the area by accident. It provides very much needed stability to your kit, as I explained already.
I'm always careful when drilling because sometimes there will be parts like this hand that would not be ideal to drill anymore into it. You can pretty much see the shadow of the drill bit on the surface and that indicates to me that the wall is super thin and it will go right through it, something that I do not want. Continuing with the process, it took a little while to get everything pinned because I did use three different methods to be able to secure almost all of them. Again, link to that video is in the video cards and the description area. Her scarf didn't have a key to connect, but it does have a unique shape that stays on her shoulders without moving. The only thing I'll do is insert a small pin going directly through both pieces. That way, the pin will remain on her shoulder and it will be invisible to everybody else but you and me. Now the hair has two separate strands that have a straight cut. And if left, the connections will pretty much be visible and ruin the piece because you'll see that it was cut. I will need to prepare both parts to leave them ready to fuse and hide those connections later down the line. I don't want to attach them now because I want to have easy access and reach for painting and shading between hairs, something that would be very troublesome. I don't need to glue the pins most of the times, but when I need something really secure, I make sure to add a tiny drop of CA glue to help keep it in place. Also, be sure not to drill through your finger. Now to fix her bra. It's not that complex, just take a 0.3 millimeter, and I'm sorry Americans, you guys need to start using the metric system. I'm not going to do the conversions for you. Anyways, 0.3 millimeter wire and drill on both sides. Putting a pin in the brake gives it way more stability than just gluing it back, especially with such a small surface to apply the glue on. Pins work to keep everything together and the glue just reinforces that. I just make sure I use the wire and pin size adequate for the pieces I'm repairing. This includes strands of hair, fingers, and even larger parts. including her finger as it will secure the grip on her rifle. It will need some extra putty, but I'll leave that for now. Most of the small pieces of the rifle were pinned except for three, which can just be glued on and they will stay in place. The strap also gets pinned with a 0.3 millimeter wire. It's thick enough to drill through without really breaking or going through it. It's also warped because it's supposed to connect to this section, but it's not doing it. This is where I bring out my heat gun and start bending and backing to shape. It just takes a few seconds to heat up a piece as thin as this. When ready, just take it quickly and bend it to the shape you need. It cools down in less than 30 seconds. Larger and thicker pieces take a bit more time, but you can also heat treat to bend them back into shape doesn't stay still on the handle and I don't want it to move. I'm fixing that by installing two small 0.5 millimeter wires to secure it to her palm like I did with the scarf. I can't have her do a Janet Jackson on me later and have her titties out because of a wardrobe malfunction. The bra doesn't have any keys to attach it to the chest, so we're gonna, gonna give her some enhancements. And this is how she looks all set up and fully pinned. Oh, 
All right, let's get her bra on. I have these printed out rods and I'm cutting a small pentacle one into two and gluing them on the back. Since I can't pin this piece, I'd rather I just be sure I'm giving her a stable connection without them. To attach the bra to the chest, she needs a little bit of mm, plastic surgery to accommodate the new keys. And that means drilling. Sorry if it makes you girls cringe. Trust me, I feel you, uh, her, uh, yeah, I know the feeling. It's going to be quick, I promise. I need to make sure there are no gaps between the parts. The yellow mustard does a great job at filling those gaps. I always apply the putty on the piece that needs that little bit of extension into the socket when it's connecting. That way I don't thicken the visible part, like her shorts, if that makes sense. Remember to always apply your Vaseline before doing this. I like to use little silicone scraper tools to remove the excess and reapply it on another area. I'd hate wasting, but it happens sometimes. Cleaning off that grease with alcohol and adding some more putty to the bra connection. I don't want any gaps on her boobs. I'm also preparing the hair connections to leave them ready to fuse them in a bit. That means sanding them as flush as possible and filling any gaps. I went into detail on how to do this with my Asuka video, so be sure to check it out if you want to know what's going on here. Now to fix those straps. I'm just applying a little bit of heat to bend them back into shape the same way I did the strap. When the putty starts to harden, I always separate the pieces before it's fully done. That way I can cut any excess off and save me some sanding time. At times, you will do such a good of a job at filling up those gaps that it will be a little hard to separate them. But when it happens, you need to have a lot of patience and be very careful so you can safely separate them. Slow and steady wins the race. You don't want to break it. I speak from experience. To fix this tiny air bubble, I like to use Tamiya's light curing putty. It hardens with light, so you need to be very careful and apply it in the dark. It's excellent for filling small little holes like this in a matter of seconds.
Before I start to sand, I will apply a very light layer of primer to all the parts. That way I can see those seam lines and imperfections perfectly and I don't have to do a lot of sanding sessions. I used to sand first, then prime, and then realized I missed so many areas that I decided to go directly to priming to see everything better. The primer always reveals everything. It lets you do the impossible, see the invisible, row, row, send the seam lines. Oh, come on, you can't take a crappy joke. Fuck off. I have this nail dust collector that I bought several years back. It's one of the most expensive brands and it was like $400 used on eBay. They have discontinued this model, so I'm just gonna say if you want something to help catch all that resin dust, get yourself one of these but for nails as they're usually more potent than the ones for hobby. I have an arsenal of sanding tools to help me with every possible sanding scenario, from sanding machines to sponges and diamond files. This little thingy is a tungsten scraper. I've been using it in the last couple of years. Instead of spending a lot of time sanding a seam line, you can just use this little tool to scrape it all away. All the links to these sanders and tools are down below. And yes, they are affiliates. So you'd be doing a girl a favor if you use them to buy these goodies. I also use a nail rotary tool that I bought for cheap that helps me with light sanding and grinding as I can control how high or low the speed is, which is crucial for delicate and small parts. I find it amusing that I always see guys asking what this is, but girls who get their nails done know exactly what's up. So many people stay inside the box and never look into getting things that are not hobby related to elevate their toolbox. How does the saying go? Oh yeah, girls rule and boys drool. After I finish scraping, it's time to smooth those areas with my automatic sanders. The red one is the Mr. Hobby sander. It sands in a circular motion. I also use the Arima 5 pen sander that sands up and down. It's been discontinued, but the Arima 7 has taken its place. Link to everything again is down below. I begin with a 220 grit and go up to 400 with these sanders. To finish everything off, I take my 600 grit sanding sponges and just polish the surface to remove any small scratches left from the sanding. I found a little imperfection on her scarf that will easily be corrected with the same light curing putty as before. For tiny areas like this where you could remove detail if you over sand, I use a special sanding knife. I had a hard time trying to get it because it was constantly out of stock, but maybe you'll have better luck this time around. The hair is almost done, but it's just basically ready at this point. For unusual surfaces like the folds of her boots, I took a circular sanding file to help me with the seam lines on the back. Sometimes it's not possible to avoid removing fine line details because the seam line was basically on top of it. When that happens, I take my tiny scriber and redo those lines like this.
I also found a little surface bubble here and took out the light curing putty to fix it on the fly. Taking my tungsten scraper to help me with the tiny parts. And we're ready for the main coat of primer. Now I have to interject here really quickly because people ask me about the types of paints that I use and wanted to know more about them. I honestly use all of it. I don't have anything specific for something. I just grab whatever it is I have on hand if I need a color in particular. Let's say I need purple and I only have acrylic purple, I'll just grab it. If I need something with high gloss, I usually pick lacquers. And if I need to paint something metallic, I'll switch to the SMS metallic paint lines that they have because that's what I have. <laughs> it really depends on what I have at hand so that I can paint something. I don't have something already planned or a specific preference of paint because I have all the equipment to be able to use everything. So in this case, lacquers and enamels and acrylics. So uh, some of it is toxic and you need stuff. So yeah, uh, I don't have anything specific to tell you. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint. I've mentioned this before, but I want to say it again. If your kit has parts that have bright colors, always use a white primer. If the parts have dark colors, use gray. If you apply gray primer and want to cover it with bright tones, the dark from the base will come through making your colors have a darker, you know, sheen. White helps you keep your colors bright while gray allows you to cover it with dark tones without having to go over it with a ton of layers to get full coverage. Once the primer was on, I did a quick check again to see if I missed anything and sure enough, there were some small areas that I missed and I quickly sanded them off and reprimed on the spot. With everything set, now I can start to apply the first layer of white because I want to use Modo's Pro Mix Skin Tone Paint. It requires a completely white surface for it to work. My primer is kinda off-white and I want to make sure that I add one to two layers of EX White from Gaia Notes to get fully covered. Before I start the skin, I'm masking out her eyes and teeth because I don't want to spend any time repainting them when it's time to do the eyes. For that, I use Gaia Notes Liquid Masking. It's pretty thick and doesn't run so it stays where you apply it. Now to start with the skin. I've already provided a guide on how to use these paints, so please be sure to check out the skin tone tutorial series. Thank you! I do have a guide on how to paint highlights and shadows on a body. The link to that is also in the description box below.
When done, I make sure to clear coat with super smooth clear flat. I always seal any pieces I'm done painting, regardless if I'm going to mask them or not later. Always, always seal your work as you progress. This avoids any paint chipping, scraping, and tears from regret. Yoko has very bright red hair. Some official illustrations have different tones, but I'll see if I have anything that works to pull that color off. For this, I need a yellow base. Yellow makes any red super bright. I've already used this technique with my Super Sailor Mars video, but it's always nice to show it again. Then I pre-shade with clear purple. Purple makes red darker when it's sprayed on top. This will create shadows. I had two reds and I was lucky to still have some of that bright one from Gaia Notes. It will go perfect for her. Now witness the magic happen right before your eyes. Black can be highlighted, not exactly shaded. For that, I'm gonna go with a dark blue to highlight all the black parts of the kit. You can highlight with that color or a variety of different shades from blue to red to purple. It's just really personal preference. And with a glossy black base, we can add a top layer of SMS silver paint for all the silver parts, which she doesn't have many, but hey, we like it some silver. Just like my arsenal of sanding tools, I also have an arsenal of masking materials. I have a variety of different tapes of different sizes and types. From normal masking tape to that one that helps with curves, which is made out of kind of like a plastic. I also have sticky tack and a variety of liquid masking from different brands. They all have different viscosities and I use them depending on what I'm masking. Masking Sol R is a little runny and I use it to seal edges from the masking tape. It seeps into those little cracks preventing paint bleeds. Gaia Notes is thicker and stays in place, hence why I used it earlier for the eyes. Maskol is actually super bunny and it's latex based. I support my masking by combining any and all of these products together. When I have a hard to mask area with normal tape like this, I'll turn to sticky tech to help cover it up. For every uneven or oddly shaped area or surface where using masking tape is difficult, I'll go with liquid masking. 
it does end up requiring touch-ups, but it's easier to cover with black than it is to cover red over black. I also don't like to waste a lot of tape and use saran wrap to cover large sections or areas. I tend to have a lot of leftover pastel powder from previous projects and I like to reuse them when possible. My preferred brand of pastels is Farber Castell. It has great pigmentation for this application. I also use gloves to avoid transferring any dirt or grease onto the surface I'm holding. I've had fingerprints appear so many times in the past on places where they shouldn't belong and I've learned my lesson. Never handle any freshly painted parts with bare hands, not even if they're washed. It's very important to previously seal the surface with a matte coat if you want to apply pastels. If it doesn't have a dull coat on, the powder will not stick to it. Even if your pieces need to be glossy, you can reseal it later with a gloss coat once you're done shading. When you're done applying the pastels, you need to reseal again to lock them in place with a sealer of your choice, like I mentioned before. I actually make my own custom pastel colors for different skin tones, and I usually choose either red or orange undertones depending on the paint I used on the kit. As per brushes, I get them from anywhere and everywhere. I like to see them in person to see if it will work for me or not. And I generally have designated brushes for paint and other brushes for pastels and never mix them. For the next round of masking, I'm using the 0.5 millimeter tape to help me with the outline. It curves easily and I can go around the leg without having to cut it. Then I'll use the curved tape followed by liquid masking to seal those edges. I don't want to use tape on her scarf, so I'm just going to wing it and apply liquid masking over the 0.5 millimeter tape to outline the edges. Let's start by fusing those hair strands. I'll start with the one at the bottom so I can have easy access to the one on the top. Taking that light curing putty to fill that seam between the two parts and then sanding the excess down. Now let's cover the sanded area with the same colors as before. I kind of forgot to paint the little area on the hand, so it's great that I noticed now before I painted it over with black. Stars, 
I also kind of did an oopsie and uh, masked the wrong section of her scarf. I, I just went back and redid the whole thing before I painted it. For her stockings, I'm using Gaia Notes Pink Flesh as a base and use some leftover clear pink I had from a previous kit. I like to give my kits depth by using different types of paint for several effects. I like using pastel paint to create a satin look. SMS has great pearl colors and I'll be using their petal pink for this one. While it does look pretty shiny right now, adding a coat of semi-gloss will kill most of it and give that satin effect. The change is subtle, but it looks like real texture of satin fabric and it works with any pastel paint from any brand. While the industry standard in anime figures is to keep everything matte except for some glossy parts, I always like to do more than that and give my figures as many textures as possible to make them more lifelike and also to be distinguished from the mass-produced stuff. Time to do the other strand to finish off this piece. I actually repurposed this old busted up airbrush needle to help me remove the liquid masking. Now please enjoy this peel prawn segment. Now, this is something I regret doing. I should have just free-handed the damn red lines. I didn't want to mask everything again, so I went the lazy route and just did a masking outline, which is going to come back and bite me in the ass later. And I can't forget to mask her belt off so that I can paint those little silver studs. I generally dislike hand painting, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Her boots need to have those red flames painted on. I could have used liquid masking, uh, just like I did the bra, but laziness got the best of me. Also, it's very hard to cover red with white, and I prefer to not have crooked edges with the masking and then having to retouch, so hand brushing it is. Which again, I hate doing, not because I don't know how to, but it's because I hate any semblance of brush strokes on the surface. I need to do really thin coats and several of them to avoid that and get full coverage. Which now that I think about it, doing that liquid masking could have been better alternative at this point. Ah, <sighs> well, hindsight is 2020. Because then this happened. <laughs> I messed up and painted over where I shouldn't have. 
I took some liquid ticks to try and clean the paint off, but it stained it a little. This is why it's important to seal between paint coats. Then you can do this without fear of stripping off the paint below. This is what I should have avoided doing, this right here. And let me show you why in a little bit. For now, let's touch up those black edges on her bra and her hairpin. So many fucking paint bleeds, it looks worse than when your period comes unannounced and out in public when you don't have a fucking tampon to save your poor expensive Victoria's Secret panties that you happen to catch on sale that one day! Uh, I'll try to fix this by doing what I was supposed to do from the start. Fucking hand brush the bitch! Thanks, I hate it. Alright, let's seal this fucking shit because I'm pissed now. When I need to do gold or silver hand brushing, I go with testers enamel, but I've come to realize that the gold one oxidizes with time and tarnishes, so I stopped using it entirely. But the silver one is still good. It goes on smooth as it self-levels. Let's do the fingernails because you guys know that I have to do them, even if they're tiny. I like to live vicariously through these figures because I can't have nice and long nails myself because they get ruined constantly because I do this. some gold pigment to color those button thingies on her gloves. And yes, this is nail powder. Again, girls rule and boys drool. Painting eyes requires a lot of practice. You also start to collect a ton of different size flying brushes to pull the work off. I use a lot of different brushes as I see fit. I have several from God Hand, this Tamiya one that's been discontinued for years that I protect like a hawk, and several nail art brushes. 
I've been painting eyes with acrylic paints ever since I started. It's what I'm used to and what I dominate, but I've seen this trend in the Japanese modeling sphere of using enamel paints. I tried it the first time with my Super Sailor Moon bust, but I wasn't 100% convinced. There aren't any really good tutorials or guides on how to use this technique. Everything is in Japanese and things get lost in translation, but I decided to give this a second try based on what I learned the first time. I made a bonus video explaining how to use this method in tandem with this one. I explain everything there, so if you want to check it out, be sure to do it when you're done here. I think it deserves its own video because I honestly don't want to get annoyed again by people asking me the same thing over and over and giving you this specific tutorial on a separate video will help deter that. I also gave my personal opinion in that video if you're interested in listening. I had so many things to say about it. Really? Do you really need to tell the world that you have trouble listening and problems reading? You know, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. As always, I want to take this time in giving a shout out to my very special patrons. You should definitely consider joining to have your name here. And also, get first dibs on my NSFW Usagi and Mamoru figure project updates. Oh, did that catch your attention? Then you should definitely check it out. A very special thanks to... Nicole Morgan, CH Shenanigans, Erica Warren, Agent Ayu, Tyre, Stephanie, Sky K, Bengenthal Lokasen, Ed Democles, Bisbot, Sean Kirkpatrick, Elizabeth Romero, Keo, Muffin and Zeko, Nastin, KitKat, Jasa05, Gabriel Johansson, Kimberly M. Sheldon, Meow Mix Cat, Madison Rivera, Indigo Mar, Sugar Miller, Noko, K. Almir, Naramus, Damus, Aisha Lee, Grim Thanatos, Alexandra Matheny, Mac or Max Doubt, Fiore Lily, Euphemism, Sage Rosado, Mandy Gordon, SK Lamfer, Meg Scrabble, Walnutty, Rini B, Kimchi Collector, Jazz Queen, Kiki, Allison Metallium, Chaos Kitty, Pika Chica, Brandy Hicks, Blech, Ishmi, Ketsy, Bacon D Eggs, Shisei Delani, Janet, Evelyn Cole, Oixis, and I Muse. Once the face was done, it was time to finish her hair. This is the part I rarely show in my videos, and it's the assembly. I glue most of the kit, even with pins. Depending on what I'm attaching, I'll use CA glue for medium to small pieces, two-part epoxy glue for larger and heavy ones, and the, the, the super gel one for general purposes. 
Assembly time is the only thing that puts me on edge because everything and anything can go wrong. Parts that fit just fine before painting won't fit anymore. You could mess up the paint because you accidentally smeared glue on the surface or you can drop a piece by accident and break it. It's nerve wracking, hence why I need total concentration and not worry about filming. But I'm doing this for you here because I, I just love you guys and I want you to experience the same anxiety I do every single time I put something together. I start from the ground up. First the tiny parts to connect to the rifle and then follow the rest. Then adding some gel glue to the rest of the parts. This is why removing or filling gaps between parts and pinning is important. Glue will have a surface to stick to and it will be impossible to separate no matter what you do. The arm didn't want to connect. I realized paint got built up on the key and it was preventing it from connecting. So I had to scrape it off carefully and try and fit it again. Now for the legs to the base. I should have done this in the pinning stage, but it completely slipped my mind. Regardless, it's easy. Let's go. Pin secure to the base, I can continue putting everything together. What I like about masking Soul R is that it's water based, and if there are any spots left, you can take a Q tip and soak it with a little bit of Windex, and it comes right off. Don't forget to unmask your face and apply that coat of UV gel to give them glossy eyes their look back. Yeah, I did matte seal everything after that. Could have you know, sealed off or covered the eyes, but I, I, okay, I didn't want to live with it. Okay, this, this, this is me. This is this, this is what I do. Shut up. Okay, this is important. If you plan to move or transport your figure in the future, it's best to not fully glue everything up because parts can break. For me, I'm leaving the hair and the hand that holds the rifle without glue, just pinned. That way I can partially disassemble her if I need transportation and it will prevent any accidents. This is how pinning your parts help. Even without glue, they keep your figure stable. And that, my Rizzy Monkeys, are the whys and hows in my process. If you found this video helpful or entertaining, please be sure to leave a like. Write a comment and let me know how you felt the moment you realized that Kamina was indeed dead and didn't come back for the next episode. It still emotionally scars me. Be sure to check out the three videos that complement the info on this one. All have been placed as video cards and in the description box below. As I mentioned earlier, the next video in this series will be going into full detail of my process for working with 3D prints. So if that's something that interests you, you know what to do. For now, please enjoy the reveal and follow me on my socials because I just dropped a really, really juicy update 
on that <laughs> spicy Usagi and Mamoru project I'm doing. And not to mention the uncensored bits on Patreon. <laughs> Which I mean, you, you should definitely consider joining if that's what, you know, if you're curious. Until next time, my resin monkeys, don't believe in yourself. Believe in me. Believe in the Leona that believes in you. Bye. You go get you a dollar or something. Don't hang with a who line for nothing. I see that we different. You riding, I double my. Don't do discussions on bragging about hundreds. Don't go to your places. I know that they sunken. Don't call me your brother. I barely could trust you. I talked to a shorty. She bagging the bucket, and I'm a new.